Part two of chapter nine will take us to China, but first we're going to make a little stop in Cambodia. So, here we go. Cambodia, the indigenous Khmer people of the Cambodian region developed a state religion of a divine ruler at Angkor. That sounds familiar. The complex of Angkor Wat was begun by Suryavarman II and dedicated to Vishnu, the Hindu deity. The square within square plan and tall central tower surrounded by four smaller towers define the complex. I'm going to show you that now. So here's your view of Angkor Wat across a pool of water that's very um, smooth, so it reflects the surface of it. Um, Angkor was a huge city complex of palaces and temples with canals and pools. It combined Hindu and Buddhist images with portraits of rulers, secular rulers, who, um, as you just heard, claim divinity. So it kind of is merging. It's what we would call syncretic, where you attempt to combine aspects of different religions, sort of merge them together in one. So bringing together Hindu and Buddhist and the, the royal, or the, sorry, the, the divine ruler is all kind of one big thing. This is another structure here that we've never seen, but I see similarities to this Hindu temple with these kind of um, pine cone type towers. This just a casual observation. So here's a better view of it showing the square within a square and all of the elevated towers. It's kind of difficult here to get a sense of scale, but I think right over here, possibly this little bright orange dot could be a human standing on a ledge. I know that there's a stairway there, so you can see it's very large and very impressive. This was completely overgrown by the jungle until sometime in the 20th century, I believe, but not real sure about that. Um, it measures 5,000 by 4,000 feet. The five towers of the central portion, so there's one on each corner and then a central one there, represent the five peaks of Mount Meru, the legendary center of the universe. So it kind of represents their foundation or their cosmology, that the center of their universe is a mountain uh, with five peaks. Stone reliefs throughout, and you can kind of see where there's a lot of carving on the stone, not unlike the Hindu temple we saw in India. Um, <clears throat> uh, the stone reliefs glorify Vishnu and the king, Vishnu, the Hindu god. I'm going to keep repeating this. I know some of you are getting it, but I, I don't want anybody to say, Vishnu? Who's Vishnu? Um, by the 13th century, Hinduism was declining and Buddhism was becoming the dominant religion um, in Southeast Asia. So that's it for Southeast Asia. Now we're moving into China, which is huge. Uh, we've already seen in part one of Asian art how, how big the country is. It's still big. It's always been big, but it had a very long history and um, it's going to continue. So despite changing political fortunes during the dynasty, the Song was a time of plentiful patronage. The Sita Guanyin Bodhisattva shows no hint of despair in his pose of royal ease. Its carved wooden figure had its painting and gilding restored in the 16th century. So here's the seated Guanyin Bodhisattva. Um, this is from Lao, the Owl Dynasty. Um, we saw bodhisattvas in early Asian art. Just want to remind you, it is the sort of the representation of the Buddha that illustrates his desire to help other humans by not letting his spirit merge with the Great One, but instead holding back from Nirvana in order to, to lead others along this path. And he's usually shown as a prince. So this bodhisattva looks very, very prince-like. Um, if you didn't know he was a religious figure, you 
just assume he was a royal. He's wearing very elaborate, expensive clothes. He has a crown on his head. The crown seems to be hiding his top knot, but this figure has the long earlobes. He's got the dot between his eyes. So there's other um, attributes that tell us who he is. So he's, I think he's gorgeous. Look at the beautiful painting on his body as well. This is no simple monk. The revival of Confucianism through Neo-Confucianism depended on a metaphysical basis. Okay, now I highlighted that, not because it's going to show up on the quiz, but because to me it is important. I, I am interested in the bones, the bare bones of principles of various religions. So the Confucianism that we saw in early Asian art uh, sounded like ideas for how to be a good citizen, for how to be a good neighbor, to live a good life, uh, to get along well. It had no sort of supernatural. There was no deity. There was no uh, discussion about an afterlife or no thought about an afterlife or anything metaphysical, which is what you call spiritual things, is metaphysical. Uh, so now it takes that on. It gains a, a mental a metaphysical basis, and that is that two interacting forces known as the Li and the Qi consist the universe. Ideas were best exemplified in landscape painting. They expressed the desire for spiritual communion with nature as being key to enlightenment. Uh, you can think of the Li and the Qi as the yin and the yang of two elemental forces, and this uh, so this sort of expands the thinking of Confucianism to something a lot bigger than just um, like a good, good neighbor code. So here's a painting that exemplifies this. And the artist is Fang Quan, and it's called Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. So can you see the travelers? I could not see the travelers. I thought the first time I saw this that it surely was a mistake that somebody had put the wrong caption on this painting. But I dug deeper. I tend to do that. And I found the travelers. So here's the detail of this painting. And way down along the bottom along this, uh, it looks like the banks of a river possibly. He's right over here. There's some little teeny tiny people. Now, if you look at them in the context of the larger painting, I think you can see that it shows humans as being very, very tiny, very insignificant within the context of this great and powerful and awesome nature. And I think that is the point of this. There's going to be um, a lot of a lot of refined aesthetics in Chinese painting, as we we're going to look at some more Chinese painting. So there are two main forms for painting, and I'm showing you this slide right here so you can get it. We just saw a hanging scroll, which is kind of like paintings in Western art. It is rectangular and it's self-contained. The other type, which I will show you presently, is a hand scroll that is, bear with me now, it's kind of like a movie where you will unroll and roll up and work through a scroll, which is very long, but you can open up the landscape physically. So it has a time element to it. That's why I said it's kind of like a movie. So it's not self-contained. You can't hang it on the wall. You have to interact with it as uh, the rolling and unrolling. <clears throat> so landscape painting took a different direction after the fall of the Northern Song in 1126. Simplified forms with stark contrast and expanses of blank space typify such works. So here is a hand scroll or part of a hang, hand scroll that um, was developed by a song artist, Zhi Gui. And the, the scroll is called 12 Views of Landscape from the Southern Song in the early 13th century. 
So I really, really like this, and I hope you can see what it is. It's ink on silk, by the way. So um, silk, the fabric, the ink, very delicately painted on there. So you can tell it's a landscape, um, but the artist is very subtle. He doesn't paint every square inch of his silk. He leaves a lot to the imagination. For example, I think you can see a body of water behind this little clump of trees, but you don't see the far edge of it. You don't even see the texture of the water. He suggests the water by showing a little boat here and some more boats here and a little shoreline over here. So he's like, why... Why do I need to paint more? This is enough. I give the, the sense of beauty of this, this location, and I've captured that. So um, it is a hand scroll, so it is long. Let's see, what is the full length of it? I don't know. And I'll show you the next piece of it. We've got two chunks. And that's the same little boat that we saw last time. So here's um, more, even less painted than the other. And so here's shoreline, a distant boat, and a distant ridge of mountains. Just, I mean, what's down here? Well, he didn't need to show that. We get the idea. There's mountains over there. There's a shoreline. Um, to me, it's very beautiful, and I hope you are appreciating this. So there's, there's nothing particularly um, Chinese or difficult to comprehend here. It's just very subtle, very subtle and very beautiful. So this aesthetic of China develops, especially among the elite people, the high class of society, the court, the rulers, anybody who... Uh, has a high position, is wealthy. So they develop this very keen, subtle aesthetic, and they appreciate things like accidents of creation. So this, this illustrates this. This is a vase that was created um, by a song artisan. And it's a very simple shape. Uh, there's nothing elaborate painted on it. There's no elaborate form. It's not extremely decorative. The, the part of this vase that made it appreciated by the song were these cracks on it. Because when it was removed from the kill, and I think you should know that the, you know, the clay has to be cooked at a very high temperature in a kill to make it very hard. And then it's removed, and if it hasn't, if it cools too rapidly, it will crackle. So we get this accidental crackling, and and this was appreciated by the Chinese, because it was sort of out of control of the artist. It was one of those things that happened, and they just were like ooh and awe over these crackles. I like to imagine that a European artist at this time, which would be um, 13th century, if a European artist had made a vase and it crackled like this, they would look at it and say, oh, dang, it's ruined, and throw it away. But instead, the Chinese say, oh, my gosh, those crackles are just so awesome. So you can see how different these two worlds are. In 1279, the Southern Song Dynasty fell to the Mongol Empire. Don't confuse that with the Mughal Empire. The Mongols, they're coming from Mongolia, uh, which would become the Yuan Dynasty. The Mongol tastes and preferences were not in line with the refined style of painting practiced during the Song era. So those very subtleties I was just explaining to you the Mongols had no use for that whatsoever. So literati scholars were alienated from the Mongol court and turned to the arts. The literati were the people who liked, made, and appreciated those subtleties. So um, they lost their main 
stream of income, which was the court. The Mongols didn't want them. So now we're going to see some sort of interning and some strange stuff. Um, this one, I would say, is intentionally nostalgic. I think it's compared to that, that those seaside views that I showed you in the hand scroll. This is so ugly. I mean, it's got all these little stripes going through the middle ground and then everybody has had to have an opinion about it and written things on it so it's like kind of messy um, but that's one of the aspects of the literati is that they get nostalgic and kind of longing for the old days when things like this would have been appreciated and there's um, the comparison of the two uh, early 13th century and late 13th century. Different artists, of course, but. And this is an example of literati painting as well. Literati painting often had a taste for antique styles, uh, which I just showed you. Zen Zhu's poet on a mountaintop has more to do with the artist's response to nature than nature itself. So, what I showed you in those um, the views of the seaside was the artist kind of standing in awe of nature and just putting nature on the scroll for the viewer to appreciate in its subtleties and its beauty. This artist focuses on himself, so he's more narcissistic. He puts himself in here and he writes a poem about how he's feeling about art. So when I say it has more to do with his response than with nature itself, that's exactly how I view this, that uh, the emphasis is now on the person, not on the nature. And here is a bonus feature that I had to include just to show you the kinds of things that the Mongol emperors did like. So they didn't like that subtle stuff, but they... Um, like in the Ming Dynasty, um, the this this kind of painting was very colorful and showy with uh, flamboyant costumes, a lot of emphasis. So we, we've kind of passed, gone past that subtle moment. And there is a literati painting versus the court style painting. So uh, there's still a subtlety to this. It's just the emphasis has changed. And over here, you've got something that's very flashy. Now, bonus feature, uh, literati or colorful and showy. Be sure to enjoy the short video journey into this painting that I posted on Canvas. It's, it's a very short little video. It was created by uh, people at an art museum, but I think it's really fun. And I want you to enjoy art, if nothing else. So Ming China became known for its porcelain. Blue decoration made from cobalt oxide was painted directly onto the unfired porcelain in a technique known as underglaze painting. The white glazing sharply contrasts the decoration. So it was painted on with cobalt oxide, which looks black, and then when it gets fired at a very high temperature, it turns this deep blue, cobalt blue. Um, this is just one example, but I'm sure you looking at this, it must ring a bell. You've probably seen blue and white China, and it all comes from this time in the country of China where they developed this style. The style was exported to Europe. Europe uh, copied this in their own, their own idiom of ceramic painting, especially in the Netherlands where you have Delft pottery. That was cobalt blue on white, and it you know it just becomes sort of a worldwide thing. But this is where it originated, and this dragon has been reserved. And there, he's also textured. I hope you can see his little scales. Then he's pretty cool. So here is the Forbidden City, and this will be on the uh, quiz as well. This was created during the Ming Dynasty. Ming architecture survives in the Forbidden City, an imperial palace compound in Beijing. It is a walled rectangle with gates oriented to the cardinal directions. Symmetric arrangement reflects beliefs about the harmony of the universe. 
the complex emphasized the emperor's role as son of heaven. I have lots and lots of notes on the Forbidden City, and I usually just, you know, pick out a few things that I think uh, are significant. This Forbidden City covers an area of about 180 acres with a total floor space of approximately 1,600,000 square feet. It consists of more than 90 palaces and courtyards, 980 buildings, and over 8,728 rooms. The Forbidden City falls into three parts. The defenses, which includes the moat and the wall. You can see the moat on the sides here. And there's a wall. I should also say that this only shows part of the Forbidden City. All of that is Forbidden City. Um, and... So the defenses, there's a 58 meter wide moat as the first line of defense and a 10 meter high defensive wall. Um, this was the home of the emperor, of course, and you can see the symmetrical arrangement of the buildings where there's a central axis, so one would enter, enter, go through. It kind of reminds me of the temple complex at Karnak in Egypt just because it's so so well planned and so arranged that there's a central axis, one line. And of course, uh, people would not be allowed, this is the inner palace here, people, um, not anybody, not just anybody could go in there. So who you are would limit how far in you could go. Um, yeah, I've got some more pictures here. Here's a plan of it showing the um, the inner part, I believe. Hmm. So you can see this is a very old plan. And you can see all the little drawings, the courtyards, and the buildings in them. Just amazing. And on the inside, I wanted to show students what one of the rooms would have looked like. This is called, I believe, the Peacock Throne. Um, not really sure, but I think it's the Peacock Throne. But it's very elaborate. There would have been so many of these. This is just one, just one of them. So this is the end of Chapter 9, Part 2. There's one more section that will be Korea and Japan. So see you soon.